Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady, you're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about siphonophores today, shall we? So siphonophores are these very strange things from the phylum of Cnidaria, making them related to another creature we've talked about on this channel before, jellyfish. And much like jellyfish, they are gelatinous, mostly hang out in the open ocean, and can have painful stings, but other than that, they are extremely different from each other. So much so that researching this video almost killed me, but we'll get to that in a minute. Siphonophores are in the order of Siphonophori, and they are found basically all over the world, anywhere from the surface of the water to about a thousand meters down. And most most are pelagic, or spend their whole lives out in the open ocean. And I couldn't figure out how long they've been around on this planet. I'm not sure if that's just because I didn't use the right search terms, or if we genuinely don't know. But the latter honestly wouldn't be that surprising, because from my understanding, we have like zero siphonophore fossils on record. Which means, unfortunately, I have to stick you guys in the... I don't know what to call this. The corner of organisms where we don't know how long they've been on this planet? I need to workshop that. Okay, with all the usual stuff out of the way, let's talk about what the f siphonophores are, because I can't get my head around them. And why don't we start with what an individual animal is? Let's use humans as an example. A human is basically a bunch of parts stuck together, right? You got the stomach, you got the eyeball, you got the skin, etc. These parts are more commonly known as organs, and organs are highly specialized, meaning they basically can only do one thing. And if I were to cut off a piece of organ from a human, let's say some skin, the skin would die immediately. If I cut off enough parts, or I cut off really important parts from a human, then the human dies, right? Now, let's talk about what colonial organisms are. For our example, we're going to use corals. At first glance, a coral might look like an individual animal, but it's actually not. Corals are made up of a bunch of tiny animals called polyps. These polyps are all identical clones of each other, and they, in general, can do all the functions that are needed to survive. Each polyp can eat on its own, reproduce on its own, attack things with its stinging cells on its own, and so on. That said, they're still all physically connected to each other, so they can easily pass resources between themselves. But in theory, you can separate coral polyps from each other, you can take a coral apart, and the polyps will not die. They will continue to do their functions. So basically, an individual animal is a bunch of highly specialized parts that are all stuck together, and the parts only survive when they stay stuck together. And colonial animals are a bunch of unspecialized parts that are all stuck together, but can continue to survive when they aren't stuck together. Basically, I know that there are exceptions to this, but we're just trying to understand the underlying concepts here, all right? So siphonophores are... Gah. Okay, if you were watching a siphonophore doing its thing, you might initially think it was just an individual animal. It has parts on its body that just eat and digest things, other parts that move the organism around, and other parts that are used for reproduction, kinda like organs. So it is an individual animal. Well, if you take a closer look, you'd notice that it's made up of a bunch of tiny sort of animals called zoids. And they're all clones of each other, and they're all physically connected to each other so that they can pass resources to each other. Okay, so it is a colonial animal. Not really, because even though they're all clones of each other, each zoid basically loses or gains physical characteristics, so it becomes specialized, and it can only do that specialized function. Wait, so sort of like an organ? Well, yes, but also no, because I can pluck a zoid off a siphonophore and chuck it into the ocean, and it won't technically die, it will continue to do whatever specialized function it does. So more like a colonial animal. Right, but, um, I mean, it's still going to probably die, because it's no longer connected to the siphonophore. So, like, how a chunk of organ might die? Or, well, no, not really, because, like, if you cut a piece of organ off an individual animal, the act of that is what kills that piece of organ. But the act of cutting a zoid from the siphonophore is not what kills it. What kills it is that it... Oh god, it, it, that it cannot do all the functions necessary to keep itself alive for the long term. Like, say one of the zoids that can only eat things gets removed, right? It can theoretically continue to survive if it can keep eating things, but since it's no longer attached to zoids that can swim, it'll just sink to the bottom of the ocean and die. Hold on, but then wait, this doesn't make any sense. But wait a minute, if what it dies when it gets me cut off, like how is this not a colonial, colonial animal? animal? Like, it's 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 it
in my head for days. Days and days and days of me arguing with myself about what a siphonophore is, even though I technically know the answer. Allow me to read you this quote. The siphonophore paradox does have an answer of sorts, and a profound one at that. The answer is that we asked the wrong question. Are siphonophores organisms or colonies? Both and neither. They lie in the middle of a continuum where one grades into the other. So after getting so caught up in trying to understand this to where I was trying to read papers about what it even means to be an individual and having a near existential meltdown about whether I am or any of us really are truly individual animals. I have finally come to terms with the fact that siphonophores are the light of biology. I will never fully understand how light is somehow both a particle and a wave. And I will never fully understand how a siphonophore is somehow both an individual animal and a colonial organism. <sighs> You know, your jellyfish cousins don't complicate things like this. They're like made out of four organs and that's it. Honestly, siphonophores, you could stand to be a little bit more like them. Anyway, I've talked a lot about zoids in general, so let's talk about them in specific. There are five basic zoids that make up a siphonophore, although you won't find all of these in all species. But in general, there are the gonophores, the nectophores, the gastrozoids, the palpons, and the bracts. The... the bracts the bracts. <laughs> the gonophores are the reproductive organs. Organs? <sighs> They're the reproductive zoids, so they're the ones that release eggs and or sperm in the water to create new siphonophores. And by the way, they can be either monoecious, meaning that they have both male and female reproductive zoids in a single colony, or on a single body, or whatever, or dioecious, meaning that entire colonies or whatever they are, are either male or female. The nectophores are the zoids responsible for moving the siphonophore around. They often look similar to the bells of jellyfish and function basically the same way, although sometimes they're shaped more like rockets and or prisms. And heads up, a collection of nectophores are called a nectosome. The gastrozoids are responsible for making sure the siphonophore eats, and we'll get into more detail on how they do that in a little bit. The palpons are similar to the gastrozoids, except they don't have have a mouth and are mostly there to circulate digestive fluid, which helps with digestion. And then the bracts barely look like zoids at all, but they are. They're these thick gelatinous overhangs that help protect other zoids and also assist with keeping the siphonophore neutrally buoyant. There are also a few parts on the siphonophore that aren't zoids. There is the stem, which is where all the zoids are attached to, and the nematophore, which is this gas-filled float used to orient the organism, the colon- the siphonophore in the water. Siphonophores are arranged into basically three different body plans. There's the cystinecta, which look like this, the physonecta, which look like this, and the calicophori, which look like this. Don't know if that's how you pronounce those words. The biggest differences between them is that cystinex have a nematophore, but no nectosome. Calicophores have a nectosome, but no nematophore, and physonex have both. Confused? Well, hold on to your hats because... <sighs> Just, just hold on to your hats. So siphonophores are carnivorous predators and they catch their food using their tentacles, much like jellyfish. Every gastrozoid has a tentacle that extends from it, which branches off into a bunch of smaller tentacles called tentilla. And each tentilla is stuffed full of nematocysts. So yeah, y'all remember those? I talked about them in my jellyfish video. Feel free to watch it here if you haven't already or need a refresher, but okay. See, I thought there was only one type of nematocyst, the one I talked about in said jellyfish video, and there isn't. Y'all, there are so many different kinds of nematocysts. Here's some of them, all found in siphonophores. And I spent a lot of time trying to find descriptions of what makes all these nematocysts different from each other, but so many papers would just say stuff like, Werner noted that there are nine types of nematocysts found in siphonophores, of which four, anacrophororopolonemes, acrophororopolonemes, homotrichus anisor, Anisorhizas and berhopaloids. 
are unique to them, and then move on without explaining what any of those words meant. But then, after a lot of searching, I found this fantastic paper with this amazing table, which defined all these words and more. But then I realized I'm still not going to explain this to you because it would be boring. So we're going to keep it simple. We're going to break nematocysts down into two categories, what they're capable of and where they're located. Nematocysts, depending on their structures, are capable of either being sticky or sticky and stabby. The fancy words for these are adhesives and penetrants. And in the tentilla of siphonophores, nematocysts are either located in the nidoband or the terminal filament. So let's break this down. This is a close-up of a singular tentillum. It's attached to the tentacle by the pedicle here. This is the nidoband, where a bunch of adhesive and penetrant nematocysts are stored in a battery. And a battery as in like a set of units of equipment and not like, you know, this kind of battery. There's an elastic band that runs ascending parallel and attached to the nidoband with a descending portion detached from the nidoband but firmly attached to the pedicle and the distal end of the nidoband whatever that means. Then there's a terminal filament which is covered with only adhesive nematocysts, and then an involucrum which sometimes cover the whole of the nidoband. Also, to make things even more confusing, some tentilla have all of these things, some only have a few. This whole structure is used to capture and kill prey, and they do it in a way that I didn't expect. Again, to simplify it, when a tentillum bumps into some food, first the sticky terminal filament wraps around the prey, keeping it in place. Then the nidoband rapidly unfolds and slaps, that is the term I read in an actual scientific paper by the way, slaps around the prey and then the penetrant and adhesive nematocysts in the nidoband stab the prey. And if that doesn't kill it, the prey dies pretty quickly when the gastrozoid pulls it up and eats it. If the prey is small enough, then one gastrozoid will eat it whole, but if it's too big, then the siphonophore will wrap the prey up in a few more tentacles, partially digest it, then eat it. Once everything is good and digested, the gastrozoid, the palpons, and occasionally the stem will rhythmically pump the food to other parts of the animal, to the other members of the colony, to the rest of the siphonophore. So there is so much more I can say about siphonophores, and I was going to say a lot more about siphonophores. Like I was going to talk about how siphonophores grow, like how do they add new zoids to themselves. I had heard a claim about how each section of a siphonophore has its own nervous system, but we don't know how they all interact with each other, and I wanted to confirm or deny that claim. I was thinking about talking about how siphonophores evolved, like what kind of evolutionary pressures were put on their ancestors that shoved them out of the binary of individual animals versus colonial ones, I maybe wanted to talk about the most well-known siphonophore of all, the Portuguese man of war. But then, uh, you know how in our video from January it started with me saying I was on vacation? Well, I went to visit a friend in Hawaii for that vacation and kind of ran out of time to finish this script. Mostly because a lot of the things I wanted to explain were either really really difficult to understand, or I just wasn't having any luck finding papers on the topics I wanted to talk about. I'd like to do another video about siphonophores at some point in the future, but uh, for right now, can I show y'all some videos from Hawaii?
thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. If you're interested, over on my Patreon, I've made a video with more footage I took in Hawaii, and I do a little bit of a narration over it, explaining what everything in the video is. So go sign up for my Patreon if you'd like to check that out. I also want to say that all the footage shown in this video was taken in Maui, including this footage of me walking along Waihei Beach that you're watching right now. And because of that, I'd like to do a little land acknowledgement. So aloha! I'm the Octopus Lady, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that this Aina, Maui, that I was a guest of, is part of the larger territory recognized by indigenous Hawaiians as their ancestral grandmother, Papa Hanaumoku. I also recognize that Her Majesty, Queen Liliuokalani, yielded the Hawaiian Kingdom and these territories under duress and protest to the United States to avoid the bloodshed of her people. I further recognize that Hawaii remains an illegally occupied state of America. I recognize that each moment I am in Hawaii, or was in Hawaii, she nourished and gifted me with the opportunity to breathe her air, eat from her soils, drink from her waters, bathe in her sun, swim in her oceans, be kissed by her rains, and be embraced by her winds. I further recognize that generations of indigenous Hawaiians and their knowledge systems shaped Hawaii in sustainable ways that allow me to enjoy these gifts today. For this, I am grateful, and as a guest, I seek to support the varied strategies that the indigenous peoples of Hawaii are using to protect their their land and their communities, and I commit to dedicating time and resources to working in solidarity. Mahalo. And with that in mind, I also want to say that I donated a little money to the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance, or Kahea. They are a Hawaiian-led organization that protects both the natural resources of Hawaii and also the Hawaiian culture. And I firmly believe that both of those things are equally important when it comes to protecting these islands. Ideally, I would be like, a portion of the revenue from this video will be donated, but that will probably only amount to a couple bucks, so I donated $50. If you'd like to donate too, link is in the description. So so yeah, anyway, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, check me out on Twitter. We also have a second channel now, The Octopus Lady, where we stream stuff like Subnautica. And I think that's everything. So until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood Octopus Lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens.